So I'm going to pass it on to Ashlyn O'Neill now, who is going to discuss the power of open educational resources and how the Office of Open Learning can get you started. And my apologies for the little typo there. Thanks so much, Ashlyn. Off to you. Thank you. Uh, hi, folks. My name is Ashlyn O'Neill. I'm a learning specialist in the Office of Open Learning, and uh, talk to you. I will talk to you today about open educational resources, how they can empower us as educators, why they matter, and uh, and what they are, and how the University of Windsor Office of Open Learning can get you started. Ah. Um, so. OERs are freely available teaching, learning, and research materials licensed in a way that allows others to reuse, modify, and to share them. So it's kind of alluded to earlier when some other uh, folks were talking that these can be textbooks, lecture slides, videos, assignments, uh, websites, open source software, games, full courses, etc. So the flexibility from this comes from open licenses like Creative Commons, which ensure that anyone can use and adapt these resources. But the true power of OERs lies with the five R's. So the five R's of OER are uh, reuse, remix, redistribute, revise, and retain. So let's start with reuse. This is kind of like the first um, entry point that many people would find uh, when they're diving into OERs for the first time. And so the reuse allows you to be able to use someone else's material or someone else to be able to use your material, whether it's for a course, for a conference presentation, faculty meetings, um, et cetera. And so it gives you the freedom to reuse, reuse resources in different ways without having to worry about copyright restrictions. When we're talking about remixing, what we're talking about is taking different components of OERs and developing something of your own that's based on something that has already been done. So we're trying to avoid kind of reinventing the wheel and trying to combine something that fits our needs without having to start all over again. The redist uh, sorry, I'll skip over the redistribute and talk about the revise component. So in this, it's kind of like remixing, but you might change specific content, add your own, you can change dates or uh, statistics. So this is a really good way to keep OERs or educational resources up to date because we know that with those textbook costs, et cetera, um, that they can go out of date really quickly and become kind of, um, you know, uh, not useful very quickly. And then you, students have to buy more versions, et cetera. So then we have uh, the redistribute component. And this is the case, I think uh, Dave was talking about it earlier, where you can then share this out to other people to also benefit from it. And in this way, we see someone might start an OER, uh, maybe it's an open textbook, and it suits their needs at that time. Now I come along, I want to use it, but it doesn't quite meet my needs. I have some different learning outcomes. I change some things, remix, I add some of my own content, I take some things out that are irrelevant or outdated, and then I share that back into the scholarly community and in that way now I am participating in what we call uh, information abundance and helping others to uh, use these tools as well and like Dave mentioned earlier with the retain option so you still own the copyright of your material so even if you put a CC license on your OER you are still the primary copyright uh, holder of that material so you can still do whatever it is you want to do with that material because it belongs to you. So why should you care? Um, I mean, the first one and the most obvious is generally comes down to cost saving for students. So textbook costs can be a huge barrier. I remember even 20 years ago when I was uh, starting university that I was paying hundreds and hundreds, almost a thousand dollars for my textbooks. Some people in the heavy sciences are paying, you know, maybe that much for one textbook. So by using op free options, we reduce that financial barrier for students who are oftentimes already paying a lot in tuition, maybe room and board, et cetera. And we know that the cost of living crisis is also very real right now. 
Another option is uh, to be able to customize. So this actually gives you a lot more freedom because you don't have to go through publisher rules to change a spelling mistake or a date or to give a different example in a statistics problem. You can just make those changes and those changes will be live and folks can still use that resource that has been updated. You can also um, take different pieces out and make it um, you know, relevant for your own, uh, your own circumstances or allow users to do that as well. And then this is also can also lead to pedagogical innovation. So OERs um, open the doors for new teaching methods, collaborative assignments where students can help create content and actually see themselves as part of the scholarly uh, you know, uh, network as well. So um, some of the OER tools and platforms have been mentioned, but we have eCampus Ontario Open Library, uh, all uh, campuses in Ontario, as far as I know, um, the main colleges and universities are members of eCampus Ontario, and you can access anything within their library for free. They have courses, textbooks, videos, other types of, of resources as well. Um, BC campus is similar, but it's located and rooted in BC. H5P, you can build different interactive resources. So you can have a video and input different uh, questions or quizzes throughout. You can develop different types of activities like timeline activities or have students develop a uh, document through a series of interactive questions, do branching scenarios and stuff like that. Pressbooks, OpenStax, OER Commons, these are all options for you to uh, be able to access and to build your own open resources. So to get started, search for some OERs first. So use those tools that I just listed on the previous slide and start looking for what might exist in your field or what in your in your area of what you're teaching. Then we want you to start small. You don't have to overhaul your whole course. Begin by maybe replacing a few readings, um, you know, finding open access articles or an open access novel that you don't have to pay for, or have students pay for, and then collaborate with your colleagues. One of the best things about OER that I have found is the intentional collaborations that it builds because we're developing these things together and trying to reach a wider audience and really eliminate barriers to both education for the students and in terms of access and time and everything like that for the educators as well. And then by that point, you'll be able to more confidently adapt resources that you come across and share them out and be, you know, an author on some of those resources that other people are going to use. So the Office of Open Learning can help you get started with an individual consultation, or you can uh, sign up for one of our workshops. I know I've run a series on Pressbooks specifically. My colleague Mark Lubrick runs sessions on H5P. Um, admit among another, you know, a lot of other tools as well. The Ontario Extend is a resource that can be useful for you if you're just getting started and want to kind of explore developing OERs. As same with the Empowered Educator Micro Credential program, which I'm actually enrolled in right now, and then using the Creative Commons license website to navigate what these licenses mean and what might be most appropriate for you. So we know that, for example, with uh, Indigenous knowledges, oftentimes there was an ND or no derivative clause so that folks aren't changing that information, but they can still use it in the ways that it's intended to be used. Oh, all right. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ashlyn. I think OERs are such uh, an amazing way that we can support students and the advice to start small, I think, is advice that we can always take across the work that we do. Thank you again.